But let's have a look at an example. I'm not going to go too far into the electronics of it, but I wanted to show you how we can use complex numbers in circuits, and it's not unlikely you'll get something like this in the exam anyway, as an example of the use of complex numbers. So a little bit of explanation before we start. Well, we have here a um, coordinate system used to represent impedances in um, AC circuits. Z for impedance. We talk about impedance rather than resistance. If I have a component here, this may be one component in a circuit, and it's got a real resistance, a resistive effect of 5 ohms due to the, the wire and all the rest of it. But it's also got an inductive effect, and that only comes into play if it's connected to an AC a supply, which is an alternating varying voltage. And that produces a back EMF effectively, which acts like a resistance of 3 ohms. So it can have a value of in written in ohms, which gives us a value of its resistive effect. But it's an impedance, and it turns out that I cannot just add these two impedances to get a total impedance of 8 ohms. The impedance effect of the inductor effectively acts exactly 90 degrees out of phase with the resistance. So it lends itself to being, rep being represented on the imaginary axis in a complex number. A positive out of degrees by po uh, phase by positive 90 degrees. A capacitive component, one that's got a real resistance, but also a capacitive effect. Again, the impedance effect of that capacitor acts out of phase with the real resistance. So I can't just add them up to get 6 ohms. The 2 ohms acts negatively 90 degrees. So that's represented down here on this axis. And the physics and explanation about that I don't want to go into now. Just enough to know that the inductance acts positive uh, imaginary axis and the capacitive effect acts down the negative imaginary axis. So I can represent the total impedance Let's say I wanted to represent this total impedance. I'd go 5 along the real axis and 3 up the imaginary axis. And so my, I could draw a vector to represent that impedance of the inductor. Equally, I could draw another vector to represent the capacitive effect. So when we come to use Ohm's law, to find the current in this circuit, I equals E over Z, I equals V over R, Ohm's law, then we can use Ohm's law, but when I want to work out the total impedance of the circuit, I have to take into account the fact that these are complex numbers. So I can't just add the resistance together, they're complex numbers. If I want to add them, I've got to use the rules for complex division, addition. rather. If I want to multiply them, I have to use the rules for complex multiplication, and so on. But apart from that, I just use Ohm's law. I hopefully you're familiar with these formulae. Current is voltage over resistance, E over Z. And also for resistors in parallel, which these are, these two components are in parallel, the total resistance is the product over the sum, Z1 times Z2 over Z1 plus Z2. Or I could use this. But for two, use the top one. Hopefully familiar stuff resistors in parallel. Yep. Well, let's use those now, but with complex numbers. So Z1 is my first component on here, 5 plus 3J, representing this as a complex number. And Z2 is 4 minus 2J. The real resistance is the real part, 4, and the imaginary number represents the capacitive or inductive effect. So 5 plus 3j and 4 minus 2j. So we're using a complex number to represent the total impedance for those two components. Taking into account the fact that we cannot just add these resistors straight up. They're acting at 90 degrees to each other, which is perfect in this situation. So Zt, I can work out. I've got to work out what Z1 times Z2 is, 
and I've got to work out what Z1 plus Z2 is, and then I can work out Zt. So that's going to be equal to 5 plus 3j times 4 minus 2j over 5 plus 3j plus 4 minus 2j. So now I use the rules of complex numbers to work out what a zt is. I've got to multiply out these two brackets, multiply these complex numbers. I've got to add these two complex numbers and then those two answers I've got to divide one by the other. So I'll just pause this for a sec. Why do you do it? You've got to do a multiplication, addition and a division effectively to end up with zt. So we get zt equal to 2.9 minus 0.098j to two significant figures. And there's the working. If you want to check it. So now we go back and we've got to work out what the current is. I equals E over Z. So looking back at the um, problem, the original problem, the voltage in the supply is 10 volts. So what we want to do to get the current E over Z which equals 10 over 2.9 minus 0.098J and what we recognize is that that 10 volts is just a real number there is no imaginary part associated with it. If there was a J number, it would be plus zero lots of J. It doesn't like zero, it's the thing. Zero lots of J. In other words, just a real number. If I wanted to, to represent this in polar form, the polar form, this would be angle 10, angle zero, because it's got no imaginary number associated with it. So if we've just got a number, the angle associated with that is zero. Now our final answer for the current, we want it to be in polar form because as I was saying in an earlier part of today, this magnitude gives us the magnitude, this gives us the magnitude which is the current in this case, and this angle gives us the phase. So at this point, it's convenient to write that in polar form. And so we can then say I equals 10 angle zero over whatever this is in polar form. So if we think about it, it's minus 0.098J, so it's negative, a very small number. So the angle is not going to be big. And the magnitude is going to be roughly 2.9. So what do we get? So we get, for the polar form for this, not surprising if you think about where this is, what quadrant it's in, and the fact that this J number is very small, it's not surprising the magnitude is roughly 2.9 and the angle very small negative number. So there we go. Now it's straightforward to get the current. To division, we divide the moduli and subtract the angles. So 10 divided by 2.9 is the value of the current, the magnitude of the current, which is 3.45 angle naught minus minus 1.9 is plus 1.9. And so for in an electronic scenario, you would now have lots of information. You would know the size of the current in this circuit, but also the phase of the current relative to the voltage. And it's leading because it's positive. So I'll explain that in this little um, axes below these axes. So if I put on here the voltage, starting at zero and going like this. Let's say that's a 10 volt supply. 
what I'm now saying is that the current, if I plotted the current, i.e. the voltage across one of the resistors, say, in the circuit, a little resistance in the circuit, I would get the current, which would be only 3.45, so it's a lot less. Don't sketch this quite yet. Oops. Something a little bit like that, not sketched brilliantly. However, what we're saying is, and this is the beauty of this little board here at this point, what we're saying here is that this is not in phase with the voltage. It doesn't start at the same time. So in fact, I can say it's leading by a bit. That means it's starting a bit earlier. So instead of starting at time zero to exactly the same time as the voltage, it's starting a little bit earlier in time, time on the x-axis. So in fact, it would be over here somewhere, and that would be the time difference. It's leading by that amount of time. So if I saw that on an oscilloscope trace, it would look a bit like that. Uh, so one application of complex numbers, it allows us to manipulate AC um, values for impedance in circuits and work out currents, which gives us not only the magnitude of the current, but also the phase, which tells us a lot about the circuit.